John Dos Passos at Mid-Century. There is a terrible garrulousness in most American writing, a legacy, no doubt, of the old frontier. But where the inspired tall talesmen of simpler days went on and on, never quite certain and never much caring what the next load of breath might contain, at his best he imparted with a new demotic flair the sense of life living. Unfortunately, since these first originals, the main line of the American novel has reverted to incontinent airs, to the gabblers, maunderers, putters in of everything. Watch. Now the man goes into the barber shop and sees four chairs with two people in them, one with a beard and the other reading a comic book about Bugs Bunny. Then the man sits in the chair. He thinks of baby's first curl shorn and, if he's been analyzed, of castration, as he lists for us the labels on every bottle of hair tonic on the shelf, records every word the barber has to say about the series, all the time wondering what happened to the stiff white brush smelling of stale powder they used to brush the back of your neck with. To get that haircut, the true gabbler will devote a dozen pages of random, random description and dialogue, none of which finally has anything to do with the novel's theme, assuming there is one. It was included at that moment because the gabbler happened to think of a visit to a barber, the way good old Tom Wolfe once named all the rivers of America because he felt like it. For every Scott Fitzgerald concerned with the precise word and the selection of relevant incident, there are a hundred American writers, many well regarded, who appear to believe that one word is just as good as another and that anything which pops into the head is worth putting down. It is an attitude unique to us in deriving, I would suspect, from a corrupted idea of democracy. If everything and everyone is of equal value, then any word is as good as any other word to express a meaning, which in turn is no more valuable than any other meaning. Or to put it another way, if everyone is equally valu valuable, then anything the writer who is valuable writes must be of value, so why attempt selection? This sort of writing, which I call demotic, can be observed at its purest in the recent work of Jack Kerouac. Thackeray said of Smollett, I fancy he did not invent much. There it all is, the two kinds of writer underscored by the choice of verb, to fancy, to invent. Most of our writers tend to be recorders. They tell us what happened last summer, why the marriage went wrong, how they lost custody of the children, how much they drank and whom they laid, and if they are Demodicists, the task of ordering that mass of words and impressions put between covers will be the, re will be the readers. Of all the recorders of what happened last summer or the last decade, John Dos Passos is the most dogged. Not since the Brothers Goncourt has there been such a dedication to getting down exactly what happened, and were it not for his political passions, he might indeed have been a true camera to our time. He invents little, he fancies less. He is often good when he tells you something through which he himself has lived and noted. He is well equipped to be a good social critic which is the role he has cast for himself. Conscious, conscious, yeah. Conscious to the Republic, stern rem reminder of good ways lost and of useful ways not taken. With what seems defiance, the first two pages of John Dos Passos's new novel, Mid-Century, are taken up with the titles of his published work, proudly spaced, 17 titles to the first page, 16 to the second, 33 books, the work of some 40 years. The list is, a, is testament to Dos Passos's gallantry, to his stubbornness, and, and to his world, worldly and artistic failure. To paraphrase Hollywood's harsh wisdom, the persistent writer is only as good as his last decade. <laughs> Admired extravagantly in the 20s and 30s, Dos Passos was largely ignored in the 40s and 50s. His new works passed over, either in silence or else noted, with that ritual sadness we reserve for those who, whose promise to art was not kept. He himself is aware of his own dilemma, and in a recent novel called The Great Days, he recorded with brave, if bewildered, objectively a decline similar to his own. 
I shall not try to wring the more obvious changes suggested by his career. Yet I should note that there is something about Dos Passos which makes a fellow writer unexpectedly protective, partly out of compassion for the man himself and partly because the fate of Dos Passos is a chilling reminder to those condemned to write for life that this is the way it almost always is in a society which, to put it tactfully, has no great interest in the development of writers, a process too slow for the American temperament. As a result, our literature is rich with sprinters but significantly short of milers. Right off, let me say that unlike most of Dos Passos' more liberal critics, I never cared much for his early work, even at its best. On the other hand, I have always enjoyed, even admired, the dottiness of his politics. His political progress from radical left to radical right seems to me very much in the American grain, and only the most humorless of doctrinaire liberals should be horrified. After all, it is not as if Dos Passos were in any way politically significant. Taken lightly, he gives pleasure. There is a good deal of inadvertent comedy in his admiration for such gorgeous, capitaline geese such as Barry, as Barry Goldwater, while page after page of mid-century is vintage old guard demagoguery. For instance, there is that old bourbon comforter Roosevelt's War. For the Second World War, while every now and then a passage seems almost to parody Wisconsin's late wonder. Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union cut off support from the communists. Stalin needed quick help. Warmonger Roosevelt became the communist god. War work meant primarily help for the Soviets to many a Washington bureaucrat. That many is superb. I have here in my hand a list of many Washington bureaucrats who, politically, politically to make an atrocious pun, Dos Passos is for the birds. <laughs> B Y R D S. Lovely. Mid century is about the American labor movement from roughly the New Deal to the present, with occasional reminiscences of earlier times. The form of the book is chaotic. There are prose poems in italics, short impressionistic biographies of actual public figures, several fictional narratives in which various men and women are victimized by labor unions. And of course, his patented device from USA, using newspaper headlines and fragments of news stories to act as counterpoint to, narr to the narration, to give a sense of time and place. To deal with this last device first, in USA, it was effective. In that hook, in that book, Dos Passos stumbled on an interesting truth. Nearly all of us are narcoticized by newspapers. There is something about the way a newspaper page is set which, if only from habit, holds the attention no matter how boring the matter. One does read on, waiting for the surprise of titillation. The success of the gossip column is no more than a crude exploitation of newspaper addiction. Even if you don't want to know what the Duchess of Windsor said to Elsa Maxwell or learn what stranger in the night was visited by Sir Stork, if your eye is addicted, you will read on numbly. Parenthetic note to writers on the make and a warning to exploited readers, any column of text, even this one, will hold the eye and the attention of the reader if there are sufficient familiar proper names. Nat King Cole, Lee Remick, Central Park, Marquis de Sade, Senator Bork Hickenlooper, Marilyn Monroe. See, I trapped a number of you who'd skimmed the denser paragraphs above, deciding it was pretty dull literary stuff. Marquis de Sade? Must have skipped something. Let's see. There's titillation. No. Hollywood. No. Also, dialogue has almost the same effect on the eye as names and newspaper headlines. In an age of worsening prose and declining concentration, most readers' attention will wander if there is too much unbroken text. On the other hand, even the most reluctant reader enjoys descending the short, sprightly steps of dialogue on the page, jumping the descriptions to shift the metaphor as a skilled writer, rider takes hedges in a steeplechase. The newspaper technique is a good one, but to make it work, the excerpts ought minimally to have some bearing on the narrative. In mid-century, one has the impression that Dos Passos simply shredded a few newspapers at random and stuffed them between the chapters as a form of excelsior to keep the biographies from bumping into one, an one another. On the whole, these biographies provide the book with its only interest, although the choice of subjects is inscrutable. Walter Ruther, John L. Lewis, James Hoffa are relevant to a novel dealing with 
organized labor. But then why include Robert Oppenheimer and Eleanor Roosevelt? And what exactly is Sam Goldwyn doing in the book? Or James Dean, that well-known statesman of organized labor? But disregarding the irrelevance of many of the subjects, Dos Passos handles his impressionistic technique with a good deal of cunning. It is a tribute to the, his method that I was offended by the job he did on Mrs. Roosevelt. He is wonderfully expert at the precise low blow. Thus referring to Oppenheimer's belated political awakening and turn to the left, perhaps he felt the need to expiate the crime of individuality as much of the crime to the solid citizens of the American Legion Post as to party functionaries Moscow trained in revolution. That's good stuff. He may not make the eagle scream, but he can certainly get the geese to honking. Yet despite his very pretty malice, the real reason the biographies work is, again, newspaper addiction. We know the subjects already. Our memories round the flat portraits. Our prejudices do the author's work. Finally, we come to the fictional characters, buried beneath headlines, feature stories, and prose poems. Walking the earth under the stars, musing midnight in mid-century, a man treads the road with his dog. The dog, less time-bound in her universe of stench and shrill, trots eager ahead. Not since Studs Lonigan's old buddy, Weary Riley, was making the scene has there been such word music. I mean, word music. Excepting one, the invented characters are cast in solid cement. Dos Passos tells us this and he tells us that, but he never shows us anything. He is, una he is unable to let his characters alone to see which will breathe and which will not. The only story which comes alive is a narrative by a dying, by a dying labor organizer and one time wobbly who recalls his life. And in those moments when Dos Passos allows him to hold the stage, one is most moved. If Dos Passos were a novelist instead of a pamphleteer, he would have liberated this particular character from the surrounding cement and made a book of him. And in that book, simply told, not only made all his urgent polemical points, but art as well. As it is, Dos Passos proves a point well taken by Stendhal. Politics, amidst the interests of the imagination, are a pistol shot in the middle of a concert. This noise is ear-rending without being forceful. It clashes with every instrument. Dos Passos ends his book with a sudden lashing out at the youth of the day. He drops the labor movement, he examines James Dean, then he does a Selinger-esque first-person narrative of an adolescent who stole some credit cards. Remember a similar story in life? And went on a spree of conspicuous consumption. Despite stylistic confusions, Dos Passos in Plain is his indictment. Doomed is our pleasure-loving, scornful, empty, flabby modern youth, product of that mid-century dream in which, thanks to, do to the do-gooders, we have lost our ancient Catonian virtue. I found the indictment oddly disgusting. I can see that there is some truth in everything Dos Passos says, but his spirit strikes me as sour and mean, and finally uncomprehending. He has mistaken the decline of his own flesh and talent for the world's decline. This is the old man's folly, which a good artist or a generous man tries to avoid. Few of us can resist celebrating our own great days or finding fault with those who do not see us now what we were or might have been. Nor is it unnatural when contemplating extinction to want in sudden raging moments to take the light with one. But it is a sign of wisdom to recognize one's own pettiness, and not only to surrender vanity to death, which means to take it anyway, but to do so with deliberate grace as exemplar to the young upon whom our race's fragile continuity, which is all there is, depends. I should have thought that that was why one wrote... To make something useful for the survivors, to say, I was and now you are, and I leave you as good a map as I could make of my own traveling. Esquire, May 1961.